Hey, readers and writers, I'm Adrian Buskey, and you're watching Fictitious, a show about the storytelling craft of science fiction and fantasy. I'm joined in this episode by The Mask of Mirrors author M.A. Carrick, which is a pseudonym for the co-writing team of Marie Brennan and Alice Helms. The first book in the Rose and Rook fantasy trilogy, The Mask of Mirrors, follows Wren, a girl who forcibly escapes the slums of Nadezhra to save herself and her sister from life in an abusive gang. She later returns to Nadezhra, though, under a new identity and with a new goal, con her way into the most vulnerable, noble house and amass her own personal fortune. But Wren soon learns that her marks are playing plenty of games of their own. Some may win her affection, while others weave layers of deceit. Figuring out who to trust becomes crucial as Wren finds herself caught up in aristocratic feuds and social upheaval between virtuous lawmen and charming crime lords and in the company of a mysterious vigilante. All while nightmarish magical corruption threatens this, the city of dreams, and all of Wren's carefully laid plans. It will take all her talents and cunning to ward off destruction, because in Nadezhra, fortune favors the bold, but magic favors the liars. The Mask of Mirrors is an intricate fantasy novel published by Orbit Books and available January 19th. Marie and Alyss, welcome to Fictitious. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. <laughs> I So the people won't catch the edit of the full unedited version of that intro where I botched like 9,000 words a hundred times trying to get pronunciations correct. And of course, you guys made it more complicated for me because there are two of you, which is a first for this show. You're my first writing pair. And, uh, and, and and not that that's an uncommon thing, but certainly it creates a completely different dynamic for writers. And so I'm really, really excited to kind of dive in and explore that with you. But first off, kind of walk us through your elevator pitch for this novel, because I mean, I want to point out, like, it's always difficult to not to elevator pitch. But this thing um, <laughs> has some heft, right? So um, it's hard to do this in the in the three cut. Um, yeah, <laughs> this is, this is not a small book. So how do you sum that up? I mean, I thought I, I was given like really, really high level with all of that, but yeah, how do you do it? Well, it's funny because I, I was actually listening to your intro and going, wow, that's really good. <laughs> yeah, can we steal that? <laughs> <laughs> can we steal that? I don't know if I can, I don't know if I can get through all of it. Um, but, uh, it's funny because we actually did sit down with, uh, David Levine, who's a fellow author and a friend of ours for about an hour or so because he's really good at elevator pitches and he helped us kind of work out, streamline our elevator pitch. So The Mask of Mirrors, which is the first in the Rook and Ro Rose trilogy, is the story of Alta Renata Viraudex, AKA Arenza Lenskaya, who's a con artist who infiltrates the nobility to set herself up with a cushy life, only to run afoul of the Rook, a Dread Pirates Robert style vigilante, whose mission is to oppose the nobility, including the increasingly popular Alta Renata. So capers, banter, double crosses, and identity hijinks ensue. And you should think the Scarlet Pimpernel meets an aged up Lee Bardugo's Six of Crows with a dash of Scott Lynch's Lies of Locke Memora. That covers a lot of thematic material there. I have seen people mention that the, the the Six of Crows, and I get that with kind of the heist element. It made me think of, and while it's always weird, like comparing, you know, books to books and stuff, although it's, it's helpful yeah. for readers, it made me think a little bit of uh, Roshni Chakshi has a book called The Gilded Wolves, um, which gets compared to Six of Crows a lot. And, and it, this yeah. made me kind of think of that tonally, I think because of you have this just like this beautiful city and, and uh, you know, this lush setting and all of this, uh, you know, kind of political and personal intrigue and stuff weaving through it and these very striking characters and so that um that came to mind for me as well but does fit in that kind of heist and caper zone and i mean everybody likes a good heist and caper right um oh, yeah. one thing that i did note online when i was um every time that i i do these interviews i go out and do kind of a dive into other reviews and other people's looks at the book because i mean i'm very conscious of the fact i'm a middle-aged cis white guy and so i want to be able to find what other people are perceiving and what they might take away from something that, that i don't but it seemed like a lot of people kind of got this confused whether it was YA or adult. 
Uh, and I know that's a, a constant problem for women writing in science fiction and fantasy in general. And I remember reading the first few, like three or four people who mentioned, oh, this new YA fantasy. And I was like, this is, this is why this isn't YA. What's, no, what's going on here? Not, no. Yeah. What's up with that? I mean, how do you, yeah. how are you? That's actually that? why, that's actually why I've included the aged up Lee Bardugo's Six of Crows, because that is something we've noticed a lot is that it gets the comparison, but in the comparison, people are expecting YA. And this yeah. is not YA. <laughs> and, and you know, just to be completely clear, we're not saying that in a bleh, YA, it's terrible kind of oh, no. sense, but just that YA has its own expectations and conventions. And if you come into a book expecting it will have those, and then it doesn't, you're going to be angry at it for not doing what you thought it was promising. And so we want to be clear, we're not promising that. The pacing is one place where it gets dinged by people who think it's YA. It is not paced like a YA novel at all. Like That's just not what it's doing. Uh, so yes, we have nothing against YA itself. We just want to make sure people know what they're getting into. We asked our publisher about it, and this is apparently something that is really common uh, for female and femme presenting writers of adult fantasy, is that they just get shelved with it YA or confused with YA, yeah. including books like uh, Rebecca Kwong's uh, uh, The Poppy War. Which, which is ooh, that expression? Ooh, yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's a reason why she, why Rebecca is called Grim Dark's Darkest Daughter, right? Like that is <laughs> not a YA novel. <laughs> yeah. I mean, not that YA doesn't get dark in its own way, but still, there's oh, sure. conventions of how stuff gets done, and you know, you've got to be looking at the right set of conventions for the book. There's a thing that, uh, and because this is a conversation that comes up quite often on the show, and uh, and one of the things that I always say is that like. I think in YA, the engine that drives the story is is always the heart and character first. But when you m move over into the adult side of things, like you're typically getting a lot more of a layered experience as far as like heavier on the plot, heavier on nuance. Um, thematics are important on in, in any genre, you know, and any uh, niche. Uh, um, but it always feels like there's there's a certain level of of character drama immediacy that sits at the forefront of YA. And I think it, because of that, sometimes it seems to move a little faster um, because it is it is so much more narrowly focused on you know the, the characters in that way. And so, I mean, I think sometimes people who are used to reading YA with that immediacy, with that speed, can go into adult-focused novels and feel like they, you know, they get forcibly slowed down a little bit versus I think people who are adult readers primarily go into YA and and it moves too fast and feels fluffy at times which is not yeah. not a valid criticism of it but it's just the the nature of just having something that just feels very different it'd be like going from adult and reading middle grade you know something that has like still great yeah. stories lots of nuance um but told with a, a level of um, uh, clarity and simplicity it's that's different it's poetry like just because it's short actually means poetry is harder because yeah. every word has to matter, it has to be streamlined, it has to have impact. And so I feel like those kinds of works, the things that are streamlined to to really hit fast, hit hard, hit deeply, are in their way more challenging because you you don't have the luxury of sprawling a little bit uh, mm -hmm. and, and exploring. And as you can see, we sprawled a bit with this book. <laughs> <laughs> now, to be clear, we, we like to think that we have sprawled in a way that like it is densely woven with things as opposed to long stretches of not a whole lot for you to chew on, but it yeah. is definitely taking its time with some of what we're doing. Well, there is a lot to chew on for sure. So, I mean, the first thing that I want to kind of tackle, I, I want to dive really deep into your process here soon, because I think that's going to be one of the big draws of this just because of the co-author situation. But I mm -hmm. do want to know thematically kind of what you were covering with this novel, because with, you know, about 700 pages or so, there's a lot of space to explore. And I've been thinking a lot about theme and cohesive theme, uh, particularly because there's a I don't want to dive too deep in the weeds here, but there was a, a very notable movie that came out just recently that sort of got tangled up in its own themes and didn't quite figure out what it was trying to say. And that was a frustrating thing as somebody who examines writing craft and thinks a lot about this stuff, that delivery, you know, that paying off what you're given. If you start a film with a couple of characters giving you a, now I'm going to monologue the theme, and then that theme does not work in the story... There's yeah. a, a clear problem, right? Um, yeah. But holding on to thematics and holding on to that kind of stuff over 700 pages is a whole different kind of challenge. So um, I want to know what you were kind of setting out to tackle as you were writing The Mask of Mirrors and then what kind of evolved on the page as you got going. 
So, I mean, I know that I certainly, and I think Alyssa is the same, like, we're not the kinds of authors who will usually start off with, here is my theme that I want to explore. It tends to evolve a bit more organically. <clears throat> and this is actually, in many ways, a very character-driven novel, though it might not be super obvious on the surface, uh, because what we came into with it was a set of characters and the relationships and interactions among them and how we wanted those to evolve. Mm -hmm. And then we had to build a world to put them in. And a I for a while, I called this an invertebrate novel because we didn't have a spine to hold it together. <laughs> like We needed to find what's that thing that's going to go in the middle that everything connects to. What we did know going in uh, was that it was going to be about this con artist. And so obviously, truth and lies was going to be kind of a central theme. Like We knew we wanted these identity hijinks. Uh, Ren takes on a number of different personas during the course of the novel. Uh, at one point, I think I referred to the book as a layer cake of like lies and misdirection and so forth like <laughs> our characters are lies of deceit that was it uh our characters lives are very complicated and so we knew from the start that was going to be a central thing and kind of along with that because i think these are connected like a lot of this is about trust and sort of who can you trust and what happens when you trust the wrong person and so forth because you know lies are a betrayal of trust but then one thing that we realized <clears throat> as we were i think like early on in the writing or maybe just in the development, we sort of looked at what we've got in mind for the whole Rook and Rose trilogy. And we've started kind of talking about it as anti-Grimdark, not meaning that it is nothing like Grimdark, because certainly it is a city full of corruption and power inequalities and selfish people and all of that. And our characters are emotionally and psychologically and sometimes physically scarred by their pasts. And they don't trust people very much and they're not very honest with anybody. But overall, the arc of the story is toward people finding who are the ones that they can trust. And hey, maybe if you work together with those people, you can actually make a positive difference. And so the trajectory of it is anti-Grimdark. It is not a world where it will turn out that trust gets you killed and honor is a lie and you will scrape the barest shreds of victory out of the smoking ruin of what you once had. Like, <laughs> it's not that kind of story. <laughs> so that was something that we discovered as we worked on it was that we want that trajectory of healing and of you know these these tangles getting unsnarled a little bit and kind of combed straight that's actually and a really nice thing to hear in a time period where redemption feels far away for you know a lot of things in our current present time period and things have kind of gotten darker and more cynical i feel like even if, if you look towards like the superhero genre where it's like it's not cool to be hopeful anymore so you have to get more cynical and more cynical and so it's nice when you get a breath of fresh air in that way um so yeah i like I, that anti grim dark i mean i've seen people throw around the term like hope punk and stuff a lot lately but i was uh, gonna yeah, say i was on a i was on a panel about hope punk and one of the other panelists and i wish i could remember who it was but that was like 10 decades ago at this point uh, it was back last march um, <laughs> <laughs> one of the other panelists was talking about you know the thing about hope punk is not that it ends at some light happy solution hope punk acknowledges that the struggle is always going to be there the the problems that you're trying to fix are too complicated too systemic to fully ever fix. So it's always going to be the struggle, but the struggle is worth it. And that's the yeah. core of hope punk yeah. is the struggle is worth it. And I think that's what we were kind of wanted to tap into is that the things that these people are doing, even if they don't always succeed, even if it causes them pain, sometimes it's worth it to do them. That is a fantastic takeaway. And I feel like people should be taking notes right now for that line um, that the struggle is worth it because I I think we all kind of in, in a difficult time period you wake up every day and you're like you know how much of effort can I give and and how much am I getting back and is it worth it every day to kind of push ourselves through some of this so that is a a wonderful thing to kind of take away there I'm going to uh, much like any good swear word uh, some people will cringe and some people will celebrate and so here's my swear word trope. <laughs> um, it's come up a lot more on this show lately, um, and I'll be a broken record for anybody who listens to the show often, but the audience awareness of trope is is vastly expanded now over what it was, I think, in the past. Um, now that it's a marketing term, it's I get you know messages being like, it's the tropiest trope book, you know, and you know, <laughs> listing out the things that people are into. Uh, clearly, fan fiction had an impact on that. Uh, clearly, marketing is catching up with, uh, with those ideas. Um, so for me, when approaching the idea of trope, it's always a question of like, 
like? Are you aware of it when you're writing it? Do you, particularly as a co-writing team, do you stop and do the uh, the Leo DiCaprio point at the screen, you know, gif thing that shows up on Twitter a lot <laughs> when you're like, there's a trope, we found one. Uh, you know, is it something you were aware of going in, something you identified afterwards? What ones kind of exist in this story? So our, our background is in folklore and anthropology. And so I think for both of us, it might actually be a little weird, the kind of current awareness and the current definition of trope as well, because it, it is we not knew the tropes same. before they were cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a whole index. The motif um, index, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, we are very aware of tropes. And I personally, and I think Maria is kind of in this boat too, I love a well executed trope. I think that there is nothing more joyful than taking something that you're familiar with and like to begin with, and, and then seeing somebody do it really well, seeing them execute it in with a twist that you've never seen before. Like I, I am a sucker for a well-executed trope, exactly. Uh, and so before we decided to work on, on this novel, back when we, we knew we wanted to write something together, but we didn't exactly know what, we actually made a whole list of, of tropes that we love. And it was things like fun banter in tense situations, confidence porn, identity hijinks, masks both real and metaphorical, strong found family relationships, morally complicated characters and the difficulties they face and the choices they make, fashion as a plot um, essential instead of just decoration, and even romantic tropes like um, trapped in a closet during a heist and fake out makeouts, which don't think we got that one in the book, but it wasn't for lack We've got of a time. fake out makeout in book two now. We do. Um, but yeah, so when we, we went, uh, hey, why don't we just write that story we've already been working on? It turned out it had a lot of these things already baked into the idea. So yeah, we, we are fans of tropes. I, I love the checklist there. There's a lot of my favorites in that as well. I, right off, I mean, beyond the fact that this book has a really great cover, just when you mention masks, I'm like, you know, I'm a kid who grew up in, in like the 80s and early 90s with, you know, where masks were just like part of every cartoon show that I watched and stuff. You know, give me a great mask or a cool helmet. I'm in. Like, I'm a sucker. Like, you've got me. Um, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so, yeah, I was right there with that. But yeah, the, uh, the definitely found family and a, a lot of that stuff. Um, it, it speaks to me in a big way, for sure. You mentioned the academic background in there. That's something that I want to touch on because I think it's going to inform, uh, you know, some of the, this, we talking about this work, but also informs kind of how the two of you met um, and how that became something because you are novelists separately before you came together, like, you know, a, a novel writing Voltron to, uh, to create, uh, you know, this piece. So as we start talking about your shared creative process, I want to know um, what that background is academically, how you met, how this kind of came about as a partnership, and then we can talk about how that creative process works. So we basically met on a hillside in rural Wales. I'm not making this up. Uh, we met on an archaeological dig in southwestern Wales. Uh, 20 years ago at this point, actually more than 20 now, because it was the summer yeah. of 2000. And we were both archaeology undergrad students at the time. Uh, we stayed in touch after the field school and both wound up going to graduate school at Indiana University in Bloomington, uh, where we were doing uh, cultural anthropology and folklore. And I guess, Alyssa, you were still kind of on the archaeology side uh, because of the because like, I was doing tourism. context archaeology, yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyway, so we we um, you know kind of stayed in touch for a few years and then became like really good friends in graduate school. We had a, a writing group there that was eh, sort of intermittent in how alive it was. Uh, but that background in anthropology and in folklore absolutely informs our writing in ways that I think are really obvious to see. I'm only slightly joking when I call the trilogy when anthropologists attack, because uh, we we knew we needed like to build a setting for these characters to live in, and boy, did we. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, we, we brought a whole lot of different influences into that, uh, which, you know, you can kind of play a little bit like spot what the origin is, because, you know, obviously the, the city of Nadezhra, it's the city of canals and bridges across them and so on. So physically, it's very Venetian. But the culture isn't really like we haven't just taken Venice wholesale and run with it, like in Versenian culture, because we've got two groups here. We've got the Leganti, who are the colonizers, and the Versenians, who are the, the locals. And in Versenian religion, for example, they believe that the soul has three parts. And like, I totally ripped that off from ancient Egypt. Like, you know, <laughs> they had the multi-part Egyptian soul. And I'm like, yes, we can totally use that here. Um, the canal thing kind of came out of the fact that we wanted it to be in this river delta. And so yeah. the foodways are also different because you get much more like a, a rice-based foodway 
And again, because yeah. we're anthropologists, we're like, ooh, what are the food ways? And you know, how is trade <laughs> impacting that? And yeah. Yeah. And then I'm like, let me go read like three books on historical Chinese cuisine to get a feel for what their food should look like. You know, uh, this is the kind of thing I find fun. <laughs> I would say, you know, that is a, uh, I feel like is a very uh, prevalent trope right now that I'm finding a lot of books is like, is food porn in the, uh, in, in the books. You mentioned earlier competence porn, which is like definitely right there in, in, in my trope checkbox, you know, but I've been noticing like, there's been this kind of this, this focus on, especially as like you're exploring fantasy, that's not just glued to European fantasy type stuff, um, that there is this kind of focus on the sumptuous nature of the meals of the places and things. So, um, and it, but it sounds like a good way to, you know, to get lost in the, in the research, especially if you start making some of it your own or seeking it out, you know, back when you could do that, when you could leave your house and, and go find food places, but but yeah. for sure. Yeah. Um, but please go on. Sorry. <laughs> oh, no, just, um, you know, so we definitely work in a lot of things and, you know, not everything comes from a specific source like that. Uh, well, one thing in Versenian religion honestly has its origins in me being annoyed at the way that Dungeons and Dragons worlds tend to handle their religion. Where you get, <laughs> yeah, Ellis has heard me rant about this so much, where you get these evil gods that are like openly worshipped in a yay evil kind of way, as opposed to what you get in reality where gods of horrible things are worshipped in order to propitiate them and to make it so that they don't visit horrible things on you. That was where we got the idea of the faces and the masks, that Versenian deities are dualistic. They've got the benevolent face and the malevolent mask. And so you kind of have to offer to both of them where you're asking the face for the blessing and you're asking the mask, not right now, please. I, I could do better without that. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got this big uh, academic background for it, uh, and you have two decades of friendship behind this. Let's figure out what that actually looks like when it comes time to collaborate. I mean, nothing can blow up a friendship faster than trying to figure out like whether or not you actually work well together. Uh, yeah. So what does that look like for you? I mean, coming in from having your own separate methods, you know, working this out together, or let's get into the nitty gritty of, I want to know the software, I want to know the methodologies, I want to know the breakdowns, the, the yeah. you know, the throwing things across the room, all that good stuff. Like, you know, <laughs> how, how does that whole process look? Two things really fed into this. Um, one is that, like, you know, you said you're coming into this, that we're both writers in our own right. But over those 20 years, in particular, I, I feel like it's been more of a one way street. Alyssa is the person that whenever I get stuck on a novel, I like fling the manuscript at them going, help me. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, we, we knew from years of that kind of stuff that we think compatibly that we have similar ways of working and similar kinds of ideas that we get excited about. And so we knew we had that. And then the other thing, and we've already sort of alluded to this a bit, the Rook and Rose trilogy actually comes out of a role-playing game that Alyssa's running, which yes, means Ren is my PC. I have committed that uh, particular writer nerd achievement. <laughs> um, and what it. actually happened was with this game, there was some side stuff going on with my PC and some of the NPCs, the non-player characters, for anybody listening to this who's not a gamer, that we wanted to do some stuff with it that wouldn't really fit into like a game session. And so we said, well, like, what if we just tried to like write it as a scene? So we opened a Google Doc and I was writing Ren's dialogue and actions and thoughts and so on. And Alyssa was writing the NPCs. And we kind of swapped back and forth a little bit for like environmental description or, oh, it's just a quick response from that character. I'll put it in. And that was a lot of fun. And so we like wrote another scene for something else. And then we wrote some more scenes. And then I looked and saw we had like 50,000 words of fanfic for this game. And I wish I were making up that number, but actually I think that's about accurate. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the point at which we said, maybe we should try writing a novel. <laughs> um, and then that and was it's, what led it's to really building. embarrassing how long it took us to come to maybe we should write that novel. That novel. <laughs> Yeah, we initially tried to come up with something else and then said, why are we attempting to like invent a new wheel here when we've got this perfectly good one over there? Uh, but that's why it started with these characters and their relationships. And then it was, we've got to give it a spine to hold all of that together and, and built it up for the novel. But it means that the way that we do this very much has its roots in how we did it for the game, that uh, we've got a Google Doc and we just swap back and forth like, 
sometimes dozens of times within the course of a given scene. Uh, we've seen it, it's actually really nice that reviews will comment on how uh, the collaboration feels seamless. Like you can't see where it's getting handed from one writer to another. And that's because mostly like we can't even find the scenes. Even in the first draft, we're going back and forth at like the sentence or paragraph level. And by the time, you know, I do a pass and Marie does a pass and I do a pass and Marie does a pass and our editor Priyanka, who is amazing, does a pass. It's really smoothed and blended to the point where we can't tell. Like, like in there's a lot occasional of things that I'm like, I know Alyssa wrote that line because I remember when I got tagged and went into the doc and read it, I was like, oh, that's good. So I know that one's <laughs> Alyssa's, but, but yeah, mostly yeah. it's, uh, it is very, very interwoven at this point. So you mentioned, you said you're using Google Docs to, uh, mm -hmm. to construct all that. The tools of the trade is always a big deal on this show and talking about like how people use which software. Obviously, even going through, you know, tracking edits and and, uh, mm -hmm. and changes and stuff with an editor is, is a significant thing. When you have two people working on something, as you're reworking passages, are you saving previous versions of it? Or are you just reworking the individual pages? Like, is there like an errata section of like of the cast off <laughs> pieces that are there to mine if you need them? How's that work? I mean, we definitely have a dump file and and that's true also of just my personal stuff because yeah. I believe in killing your darlings, but keep the corpse just in case you want to, you know, resurrect it later. <laughs> We're necromancers. Um, <laughs> we are necromancers. <laughs> I'm so I'm curious here too. Then, like, I mean, were you uh, approaching this as did you outline this? Were you discovery writing, uh, and how does that work as as a combo? <laughs> we on our own, neither of us is really that much of an outliner. Like, we'll maybe know there are some particular beats we want to hit later Sorry. on, and and you can see a bit of that in this book that we went into it saying, okay, here's roughly what's going to happen at like the one quarter point, the halfway point, the three quarter point, but mostly on our own, each of us is more of a discovery writer. That doesn't work as well when number one, you're working with two people. So mm -hmm. that whole, I've got this nebulous evolving cloud of the story in my head, there are two heads. <laughs> they need yeah. to both see that cloud at the same time. <laughs> right. <laughs> and also the sheer amount of intrigue and deception and which character knows which things and which persona of theirs can admit to knowing it and just, there, there was a point where I actually had to make a list of the different bits of plot and who knew it and which persona of theirs could admit to knowing it. And, uh, you know, did people know that they knew it and all the rest of this stuff just to keep it straight? You can't wing that very well. Yeah. <laughs> Though I will say that really complex plots like we do have, I think are much more possible when you have two brains picking at them yeah. to find all the holes and, and yeah, smooth them over and plug them up and answer all the questions that didn't get answered. Like, yeah. And there there was one point in the revisions where we realized that there was something that neither of us had caught until very late in the game. We're like, we've got the whole novel and oh crap, this particular detail, it was a character's name, got mentioned in a context where we're like, wait, but if it got mentioned there, so this person knows it, which means that thing over there is going to fall apart and oh God, like our scorpion tail managed to wrap around and stab us in our own back. <laughs> um, it probably took half an hour of us just kind of like staring at the ceiling going, shit, how do we fix this? Yeah, and just thinking having... through all of the domino implications of how to deal with that and how to fix it so we didn't have to like rewrite the second half of the novel. A small change that would let us fix it. It, it didn't mean we had to kill a darling. There was a line we really loved that we had to take out. Um, but, you know, <laughs> that line or the entire second half of the book, that line's dead. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's something I'm always uh, fascinated in in the writing process is when you back yourself into a corner and how you respond to it. And um, over the course of doing this show, I mean, I've had ones like uh, like Kai Dor, who was on the show, talked about how she wrote herself into uh, a corner at the end. And so she just had a rock slide, kill all of her characters, cut off the last third of the book and just started over. Right. Um, just because that's <laughs> that was as good as it was going to get. Just mm, just let's literally kill the darlings and we'll, you know, flashback and, and fix it. Uh, and other people having to figure out like uh like uh, Cass Morris was just on the show and, and I asked her about writing prophecy in the book and her realizing that the prophecy wrote, she wrote in the first book screwed her in the second novel. And so she had to completely rework how this thing was going to function. So I love hearing about the problems because that's the stuff that I think people, as they're starting to write, as they're approaching their own first novels, that they're not prepared for that first time. And you realize that you've really screwed the pooch and you have to figure out like how to do that. So for you guys, I mean, fixing that, like, what were those discussions like? Cause you said, you had like a moment being like, oh my God, what are we going to do? What did that look like? There are, 
there are some ways, but before we get into how we fix the things that really do require us to backtrack, I actually think gaming is a really beneficial hobby in that sense, because you can theoretically in a game say, let's just pretend that, you know, that thing that happened 12 sessions ago, something different happened, but it's never satisfying. And so more often what you try to do rather than just retconning something from earlier is you say, okay, well, if this is what I'm stuck with, then how can I steer that in the direction I need it to go? Like with that prophecy, you know, it would be, okay, well, I can't, first book is on the shelves. I can't change that. How do I work around it now? You know, I, I think that's Dead actually a opportunity to climb a wall. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> you got to kind of learn a bit of that for for gaming, certainly. And it's good in writing for the the actual problems in the books. Um, a lot of rolling around on the floor, staring at the ceiling and like rehashing. OK, what are the pieces that we've got in play? And like, how how are those things interlocking? Is there a gap between some of them where, oh, if we like add that detail in there, would that let us then do this other thing over here? It's it's yeah, mostly think, an intuitive process though. I yeah, love that you brought think, up the gaming part of it though, because I mean, I think that is very much a, a I think gaming will also teach you that if you introduce something that's too powerful, uh, whether it's, <laughs> you know, a magic item, an ability, a MacGuffin, uh, that can really stab you in the back later on. If you, like, I've got a, in, in the game that I run this game, I mean, it's gonna really dorky but like i've there's a we've got this dwarven cleric who has this forge ability where he can sort of just if he has a hundred gold worth of metal he can make anything non-magical that's worth about 100 gold yep. and i learned very quickly that that can really break things really fast because uh it's stuff that should be difficult for them to come by he can just create on his own and that's just in the rules in there I, um, so I sometimes had, think the game designers need to look more for that kind of thing because the number of low-level spells i've seen in games where i'm like do you realize that like this, oh, I can send a message to somebody that turns into this little bird and flies off is the instant tracking I can find anybody if I cast that spell enough times? Like, mm -hmm. and it's a level one thing. Like, did you think this through? Yeah, and that's, uh, and when, especially writing fantasy novels, uh, it's, it's if you introduce an ability, if you have it in like the, the first or second act and then the character just forgets that they can use that the rest of the, the story, that's really glaring to audiences. Uh, and Which you see it happen all the time. A, a rant I saw online at one point where somebody was like, who the heck wrote the 20th century? I mean, this is so badly written. Like, you introduce this super weapon in this war and then nobody ever uses it again. <laughs> like, <laughs> but history is allowed to be less narratively tidy than we require of our books. <laughs> the current era will also shows how often we would never buy this as a story. We're like, no, this doesn't make any sense. There's, yeah, there's no narrative logic to it. And yet, this is reality. So We have had discussions about how our bad guys are not as bad is what we've been living with despite our best efforts yeah it's it's definitely a weird time for that i, I want to swing back around into characters here in a second um we touched on world though and you mentioned this venetian kind of background i feel like there's like eastern european there's probably victorian england kind of touches in here you've mentioned that you know there you're looking at like at more like asian food types things as, as the you know the food ways and how that's affected stuff this is again a 700 page novel with a complicated structure and a lot of going on there's lots of no Noble houses. There's lots of political intrigue. There's, uh, you know, two different ethnic groups, kind of like colonizers and indigenous, like you know, kind of warring against each other in a lot of ways. An impoverished group um, against the aristocracy. There's a lot happening here. So, um, can you kind of talk through that? Um, then I want to touch on the magic system because I think you did something unique here, and that it's a fantasy novel where the magic doesn't show up for a while. Uh, and I want to kind of get your thinking on that. So, what can you kind of? I mean, we have talked about this word a little bit, but just contextualize it a little bit more for the audience. This is something that I'm actually not going to take credit for because I actually think it was the um, World Building uh, for Masochists podcast where it might have been Marshall Ryan Maresca was the one who said this. It's like, oh, yes, that's very clever. And I'm going to pretend we did that on purpose. Um, somebody <laughs> pointed out that because our main character is a con artist, she's pretending to be this foreign noblewoman uh, coming into Nadezhra when, in fact, she grew up in Nadezhra. And so be, when we were in her point of view, the reader gets to see her making all of these calculated decisions about how she's going to behave and that actually lets us work in the exposition through the decisions that she's making and why she is making those decisions uh which i think helps a little bit with orienting the reader without having it be the thing that you get in a lot of novels of the naive protagonist who doesn't know anything and has to have it all explained to them and taught to them instead she's very experienced 
and is playing an incredibly complicated game of Cat's Cradle with her experience, basically. Yeah, that is a nice way to be able to kind of get that exposition and, and explore it, because I think a lot of novels have to kind of, like you said, they have to sh- shove in the wide-eyed newbie. And there are definitely films and books that suffer a little bit because the you kind of shoehorn a character in that you don't really need. Yeah, so having this perspective is very cool. I, I think it's it's interesting to look in, in especially in the last couple of years, where uh, in the news we found a lot more people who have been sort of living these dualities, right down to like Alec Baldwin's wife isn't actually like Spanish, uh, which was like a news story here recently where she'd been sort of masquerading as that for a long time, which is a pretty unusual choice. Uh, and there's been lots of other ones that have been kind of fascinating with that as well. I think a big part of the tension of this book comes from a character who is weaving a lot of lies and lots of different you know, identities and always being on the verge of getting caught. What are these different groups that she's moving through? Because we've mentioned there's noble groups groups there is you know there are crime lords there is a vigilante like uh, you know there's a lot of different things so like w- what are we weaving through what does that social structure look like for her and who are some of these people that she's running into we've got the the Legante colonizers that i mentioned and then the versenian indigenous population but nededra has been colonized for about 200 years and so there's also a large uh, probably like about half the city honestly it has ancestry on both sides at this point uh, it is actually really intermixed uh, and there's you know tensions around that as well so you get both the the blending of the cultures in some ways, but then also the question of do people identify more with one side or the other, or do they just kind of call themselves Nadezhran and not you know, care too much uh, what the balance of the ancestry is. And with uh, the city being on this river delta, uh, it's on this one channel that's split by an island in the middle. So you've got the upper bank, which is where the richer and more influential people tend to live. The lower bank is where you have the poorer ones. And so we play also a lot with uh, that kind of class tension. Ren grew up actually on that island in the middle, quite poor, but was taught how to pretend to be rich and noble and so on. And so uh, we've got... Grace Rado being this sort of cop type character who works on the lower bank. Uh, De Rossi Vargo is a crime lord, but Ren is infiltrating this noble house. The story definitely weaves back and forth between those two sides quite frequently because that was one of the appeals for us. Like we didn't want the all noble politics all the time or the all street gangs all the time. We wanted to show how these things actually wind up slamming into each other. And that's where a lot of the fun comes from uh, is that friction whenever you do bring those things up against each other. Uh, I mentioned the magic system. The magic kind of starts to figure in maybe like halfway through. I mean, I don't know an exact page count, but it's a, it's a little ways before that starts to really, you know, come up as an important thing. And there's a lot of layers to it. Uh, it's not just that there's one specific kind of system that's running through this. It's a big combination of a lot of different stuff. Uh, why choose that kind of methodology for it? Uh, again, how did you kind of track all of that, you know, in writing it together, but also thinking about how that affects the world and how it will change over drafts and stuff like that and just yeah what can you kind of tell the audience without getting too again because it comes in like halfway through without getting too spoilery what is the magic system here the magic is actually always there but it is integrated so well into the society as something that is there should be that it doesn't seem significant until some certain plot things happen that pushes it to the fore makes it significant because it's unusual and the magic starts unusual things start happening through the magic. And so, you know, you get a uh, pattern, which is the divinatory system. You get pattern readings early on. You see Numenatria used in a variety of ways, uh, like technology, um, where it's used mm-hmm. to shore up foundations of, of these islands that people live on. And it's used for lighting. You see imbuing in, uh, which is the way of crafting that improves what you make. Uh, you see that in just the things that people are using. It's all there, but it's not significant until halfway through the book. It's a bit like, you know, people who live on the slopes of a volcano and, you know, those little things of like the ground shakes every so often and like there are the steam vents and so on. And that's just normal. And then halfway through the novel, the volcano erupts. That's kind of the uh, the metaphor that I think I would use here because yeah. we get annoyed again, like we're both gamers, but we'll rag on D&D uh, where you've got these basic low level things of magic that you're like, that would just make your lives so much better. And yet no one ever seems to think to put purify food and drink on their sewer system for automatic, like, you know, water processing so that you have a clean sewer outflow. Like, why doesn't anybody ever do this if you've got that magic available? I was recently talking to a group of very experienced uh, male gamers, and I mentioned that every game I've ever been in, I've developed a spell for birth control. And they were like, blew their minds. And I'm like, Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yep. There, there is magical birth control in our setting because 
if you've got magic that can do that, it is one of the things people are going to use it for. Right. I mean, everybody is like, if they have some type of magical ability, they're going to apply it to whatever is foremost in their own mind. And, yep. uh, you know, it would, which would probably be like, you know, you would have magical Viagra because it would be like, you know, if the, all the men we have that. Around. Yep. Right. Yeah. So it's like, it's... that was Marie's doing. <laughs> no, you mentioned it at one point though. I think the line got cut. I'm just the one who put it back in, in the second book. <laughs> But no, I'm not going to say that it's like equal access to this through the world, because like we mentioned, there's a lot of class inequality and in particular Numenatria, which uh, we can talk more about the magic systems. Numenatria is the one that Alice really invented. It's their baby. That one is associated more with the Leganti, who tend to also be the wealthy elite of the city, whereas Pattern is associated more with Versenians. And so it doesn't get the same kind of respect among the elites, at least Versenians respect it. Uh, and then imbuing is kind of like the unloved stepchild of the three because it's actually hugely pervasive. It is basically the magic of doing something when you make an item or less commonly when you're like performing in some fashion to make what you are creating better. So like an imbued knife cuts better, it doesn't dull or chip as easily, it doesn't rust as easily, but it's just so pervasively interwoven into the daily life and it doesn't have this whole ideological system behind it. So basically nobody in the setting really can't, thinks about it. <laughs> you can't go to school to learn to imbue. You learn to, yeah. you learn to forge knives or you learn to weave or something like that. And as you become better and as you put this kind of meditative intention into it, that is imbuing. And so it's not really well regarded as a, an activity. It's just taken for granted, yeah. It is one of the reasons that um, uh, mass manufacture is not as common or not common in our society because if things are magically better because they're artisanal, you're going to have a much better, bigger demand for artisanal goods. Uh, right. So, yeah. uh, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, um, and that's the type of like world building stuff that I think is, you know, you get a lot of, of, uh, of fantasy and sci-fi that kind of leans on things that you recognize. If music has the great American songbook where things are kind of like, you know, built on structures and patterns that you already recognize, uh, a lot of genre has that same, and every genre has things that um, are yeah. just sort of the fabric of it that you don't need, necessarily need to explain because you can kind of count on the audience to know it. It's subverting those things or detailing out the world in a way that um, makes it more real i think clearly your academic backgrounds and the way you think it affects that because it allows you to consider that in a way is that a lot of, yeah just a little bit but um but i think that that's a fascinating uh way to explore that and uh, it's a really fun concept in there uh something else i want to talk about before we uh jump into the characters is uh i think it's worth noting that this world has a casual queerness to it um there's gender fluidity uh you know there's there's there are plenty of people who are queer and it is not what we might find sometimes where it feels like that is uh, a you know downtrodden class or like a, you know or a, a people that are facing an adversity like that is just the nature of this world which to me is just so incredibly refreshing at this point i'm i'm so much happier to read stories where it, it like it is just people being people um and they don't have to justify their existence and or have an oppressive I mean, lots of other kinds of oppression happening but that's not one of yeah. them so uh i want to know your own approach in this uh and just kind of talk about that uh aspect of this world a little bit being queer and genderqueer myself uh, and having struggled a lot to understand those identities when for a long time I did not even have the language for them, I only want to imagine worlds where that is normalized. There are a lot of other stories out there and they're useful. I'm not interested in thinking about them or telling them. Um, and then being anthropologists, Marie and I also know that contemporary models of gender and sexual identity are very particular to our time and place and that those things have been understood very differently at other times and in other places. So when we were creating the Leganti and Versenian cultures, we started from their worldview and kind of that we had already been working on and extrapolated out from that how gender identity and sexual identity might be understood in those cultures. And because each society views things slightly differently, it actually gives us a chance to suggest that all of these things are constructed categories that people use to define and shape uh, the fluidity of their lived experiences. Mm -hmm. One thing I will say I struggled with in, in what we created was that both of our societies come from a worldview that privileges dichotomies. Uh, the face yeah. and the mask yeah. is a very Versenian thing, sunwise and earthwise, and the two moons are a very Leganti thing. And that actually means we, we don't have a defined space for non-binary people. They exist, um, including Oksana Rivcek, who's this badass duelist, uh, she comes to mind. 
But even that is kind of our way of showing that there are more genders and sexualities than can ever be codified uh, in language or in culture. Our, our cultures have built-in structures for if you are trans, that they've got a, a way that they understand that and they've got a term for it and a way that you fit into society. But yeah, it is not we have taken our modern approach uh, to gender and the the notion of like, you know, people who are just non-binary and, uh, you know, uh, gender fluid or something like that. They don't have structures for that. But there's a difference between not having a structure for it and people not necessarily, uh, you know, feeling that way and so on. But yeah, so we we wanted to build in something where it had some kinds of uh, different approaches to gender without it being strictly the one that we sort of live with today. Taking a lot of inspiration from, uh, again, like you know, h historical and uh, other parts of the world ways of thinking about gender. That's yeah. something I think that uh, we struggle as a Western audience a lot is that um, a lot of people's idea of history is based around our fiction. It's, you know, so often that fiction is just built around our <laughs> modern whitewashed conceptualizations of things. And so you have a lot of, it's much the same problem as people who think that like that, you know, Europe in the Middle Ages was just all white and it very much wasn't. It's just they watched a lot of BBC and a lot of period pieces that just pretended that those people <laughs> didn't exist. And so that's their yeah. idea of reality. And um, yeah. and I think that same thing comes with ideas of gender and stuff, too. And um, it's, it's just nice to see it explored in a way that um, isn't about the pain with it. I mean, I a friend of mine was talking about how, and this is tangential, but he just watched the movie Soul. And, uh, and as a black man, he enjoyed watching that movie because it was a film that wasn't centered around black pain, but just the black experience. Right. Yeah, and we yeah. just there, watched that the other night. <laughs> yeah, and certainly there's, there are criticisms that could be made about that film in other ways, but for him, that he was just saying, he was like, to just not have that be central for a little bit, to just be and it not be about the struggle was like, that's what he needed in that moment and appreciated yeah. it. And I, some, I, I, I think it swings back around a little bit of that hope punk idea, you know, like right. um, to feel like the struggle was worth it. Sometimes it's worth just seeing the outcome of it. Um, well, especially yeah. because if we only tell stories about the pain and about the struggle, then there's a sense in which that reinforces the idea that those are inevitable. That like yeah. you cannot even in fantasy we can't imagine a society that doesn't have like you know rampant sexism or something. And like let's imagine that that isn't inevitable. That you can have a world where people are not automatically going to be oppressed because of blah. Yeah, Alina Boyden was on the show a while back talking about her novel Stealing Thunder, which features a trans main character. And one of the things that she had set out to do with that novel was to have a story that picked up after her character had been living as a woman for years. It wasn't about the transition. It wasn't about discovering mm -hmm. what her gender identity was. And she right. already had a found family of other people who were similar to her. And so that was the thing she was like, she's like, I've lived this as, as a trans woman for the last 15 years. I don't want to tell that story of transition. I want to tell what it means to live that as your truth. And I really found that super compelling. Um, and, and it's always worth exploring those stories as well, because the, you know, knowing the struggle is also important, but also just seeing what it's like to just be yourself as that person is really important yeah. to find as well. Release the tension that you're always kind of holding yourself in, waiting for the media that you're consuming or the world that you're living in to hit you. Yeah. You can just kind of relax and enjoy the story that you're in without waiting for that constant expectation of that little microaggression, that abuse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a beautiful line in one of the late uh, Peter Whimsey novels of Dorothy Sayers where like the, the romantic relationship has kind of been, you know, finally sorted out and the the female character talks about like you can't imagine which because she's gone through all these horrible things you know what it's like to live just always like tensed up and you know what it's like to look at the next thing that's coming along with like you know hope and, and joy basically rather than thinking oh well the last one wasn't too bad and this one might be quite bearable if only such and such doesn't happen she's discovering what it's like to live not having that knotted up inside of her and that's actually one of the quotes that I've got on the page of like quotes that are inspirational for this series because Ren lives her life kind of always tensed up and waiting for things to go wrong and, and is going to discover that maybe it doesn't always have to be that way. To draw kind of a, a comparison, it's like if you've, if you've gotten an injury, let's say like you sprain your ankle or something and you walk around for a couple of weeks barely able to walk because it always hurts and then it finally goes away. 
like it's not so much that you got better, it's that you returned to normal. You got to your status quo and you got to a level of comfort where it just, you know, it's not that you felt amazing, it's just that you just didn't hurt anymore. And that level yeah. itself can feel incredible once you've gotten past the pain. It's not living with that tension all the time or not living with that sense of worry. Um, I think it's, you know, in a time period where people have all this economic anxiety or worry about just going around and being around people who, you know, you're afraid somebody might cough on you, um, you know, or people won't wear their mask yeah. or whatever. Like, yeah. we all just kind of want to get back to the sense of a status quo normalcy, even though that status quo looks very different for a lot of different people. Um, but just to yeah. breathe easy, easy for a little bit. And we're all missing that. I'd also like to add one thing because uh, this is a conversational listen I've had several times that w with that whole like let's start the story at the point where you know you've already been living that life for a while. Uh, you also see this with certain kinds of plot things that we have so many romance stories that are about the characters meeting and falling in love and declaring their feelings for one another, and we both crave some stories of okay you are in the established relationship. What are the interesting stories to tell about that part? rather than it always being the beginning of the story over and over again. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's something that, again, with this series, we we want to pace things so that it's not just, we're going to show you the moment this thing begins, but we're going to show you then how that grows and changes over time. I think it's important to have those stories rather than always focusing on how the change happens, basically. Yes, yeah. absolutely. I, I love that point for sure. So we were pretty deep into the interview at this point. We could spend another like half hour, 45 minutes just talking about Ren or Captain Gray or Vargo, who seems to be like a fan favorite breakout uh, from the people who have read this this book early. People like uh, morally suspect characters. <laughs> morally suspect competence porn. Are you kidding me? Like, like <laughs> that's where we're at, right? Like that's we're hitting all the buttons with that one. Um, also, you, and you have the Rook you mentioned earlier. So you have the, the Dread Pirate Vigilante in there as well. There's a little something for everybody going on here. Oh, yeah. We tried. <laughs> but uh, I want to uh, I want to step past that just for a second, circle back around to the writing as a partnership. For people in this audience who are perhaps uh, exploring that idea of writing with a partner uh, or maybe have already started doing it and are trying to figure out their way through, uh, now that you've gotten through 700 pages and I assume are working on the uh, the sequel in the trilogy. What kind of advice do you have for people who are approaching writing as a partnership, how that works both fundamentally as friends, um, as coworkers, essentially, um, that managing that flow, uh, just everything about that experience? What wisdom can you impart? <sighs> Uh, well, it, it, this actually segues nicely out of the thing about established relationships, really, um, <laughs> because much like with any kind of, you know, marriage or other kind of partnership, a huge amount of it is communication. Like, actually, the, the advice that I have is not even so much about the craft of the writing. It's about figuring out how to do this in a way that is going to protect the relationship that you have that you are friends before you go into it. Uh, one of the first things that we did when we decided we were going to do this project was we actually wrote out an agreement, which now that I think about it, we should maybe put on our website. Um, like we said, you know, okay, here's the project that we're working on. Um, here is the like baseline level of how much we're going to try to do each week, which was hilarious. We said we would try to write 5,000 words each week. We averaged more like 10,000, I think. Uh, some yeah. weeks it was more like 12,000. We yeah. overshot. <laughs> but the purpose of establishing that baseline was to say, if we drop below that level, then we need to have a conversation so that neither of us would be sitting there going, I'm frustrated that we're not keeping up with this, but I don't know if I can like bring it up yet. Like, should I raise that point? You know, setting the thresholds for how often are we going to talk? What's the point at which one of us can say, this isn't working, we've got a problem. Uh, establishing, you know, that, okay, we're going to split the money from this 50-50, that either of us can go write short fiction related to it, and the other one can, like, read it over to make sure it's not wrecking something. But, you know, like, I've written a short story that just came out from Beneath Ceaseless Skies, as tight as any knot, that is a, a kind of prequel story. Uh, I wrote that one, so that one's mine, um, even though it's printed under the name M.A. Carrick. Uh, so, basically laying out those things in an agreement that we signed, because, like, I run into people who think that, oh, you know, they don't want to be super formal about it because they're worried that that's going to interfere with the friendship. And I'm like, no, this is the safety harness for your friendship to make yeah. sure that you Laying don't. out expectations means, I mean, for me, it was, it was helpful just because I then had something to like work towards 
and to know whether I was fulfilling my part of the bargain or not. Yeah. And when we get into the writing, the the thing that we have, again, we've had conversations between ourselves about this more than once, that we both like can actually trust the fact that if one of us goes, yeah, I mean, that that suggestion of yours it could work, but it's not like really sparking for me. It's not catching fire. Like I think we can do something better. That the other one's not gonna get like all butt hurt about it and be like, "Well, you don't like any of my ideas." Uh, that we can challenge yeah. each other to like come up with something more vivid, come up with something more exciting when we're writing back and forth. Like if I've written a paragraph and Alice goes, "Oh no, I kind of want to have this happen next," so I'm gonna go in and revise what you wrote. I'm like, "That's fine." Um, and sometimes we have to stop and have a conversation about it of like, oh, well, I thought we were going in this direction. Okay, but no, I can see why you're doing that one. How about we do this and then both of our ideas fit in there? You've got to be able to have those conversations with each other and not feel defensive. Any any collaboration is, uh, it's kind of like a mini marriage. Uh, I, I, yep. I used to be a band guy and played in bands and like, and that's like being married to like three or four other people, uh, you know, and collaboratively trying to figure out how things work and figure out like that war for control of like, who's the leader, who's controlling where things are going, like, who's just kind of along for the ride, you know, and, and writing, you know, you're bleeding on the page every day, like putting your heart and soul and all your creative energy into it. And you do have to have hard conversations about what works and doesn't. So I really do do hope you put that um, this some version of that document on the website. Um, I would love to share that with the audience uh, because I think that would be really, really valuable uh, to take a look at. I think that's just a brilliant idea, yeah. and it just I, sounds I can very post that as, soon as we're done recording, pretty much. <laughs> oh, awesome! Yeah, shoot me a, 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 a link to it, and I'll put it in the show notes for this uh, because I think I, it'll be really worthwhile. I will say uh, we actually then signed a second and more formal like legalistic agreement later because we decided that we wanted to write the novel on spec and make sure that we could collaborate for like 200,000 words uh, mm -hmm. before we attempted to sell it anywhere and contractually obligate ourselves to go on doing <laughs> that. Um, so after we had written the novel, I like any writer out there who is agented, it is likely that your agency has a collaboration agreement. So we then signed a formal one from, I think it was maybe the Alyssa's agency is where it came from. Yeah, I think it was on last, yeah. Uh, yeah, doing the the sort of our version of it first, because ours also covers some things that weren't in the formal one, like related short fiction and such. Um, so yeah, like you may also be able to get this from your agent, but it's good to work out some version for yourself before you get that far. Yeah, and especially also in an, in an era where uh, you know adaptability is is something that's in a, a lot of considerations as well too. Thinking about you yeah, know, well, call us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you look at like a, like a James S. A. Corey is a you know is is a writing right. team of you know yep. Ty Frank and Daniel Abraham and you know they have the Expanse series, which has you know been a big hit in science fiction and know it's you know TV long running TV series. That's that's a whole other thing to to think about how it's like it's not just the writing of something, but what it, how it lives afterwards and how right. it gets yeah. shared and. So and so we've important. got things like if somebody comes and says we want to make a TV series, which we would happily entertain offers for that, um, both of us have to agree to it. Like that is yeah. in our yeah. agreement that both of us have to sign off on this. Neither of us has the authority to say, sure. Right. Yeah. It, well, and because you want to make sure you've got the best deal and the right adaption and the right people and all those things. I think at the core of things, too, it's like if, you know, if your friendship came first, you have to defend that aspect of it. And right. that comes from mutual yeah. respect um, and recognizing yeah. Yeah. that um, at the end, it always every decision has to come down to we respect each other, we will do this together and not just be like, oh, dollar signs, um, which yeah, can yeah. be you know, dangerous to anybody at any time. Um, as we wrap up here, uh, I, I always want to know where people can follow uh, the work of the author. Now, clearly, it gets more complicated when it's... Uh, <laughs> we have when it's... many answers. <laughs> right, yeah. yes. So, uh, so, M so M.A. Carrick as an entity, where do people yeah. follow them? And then, you know, and then you individually and the stuff that you're doing, where should people be, be keeping up with you? Uh, so for M.A. Carrick, it is macarrick.com. And I will note that uh, we have a widget up on our website where you can do those divinatory pattern readings for yourself. We are very proud of this widget Ooh, and want fun. people to go play with it. Uh, <laughs> we didn't actually get a chance to talk about pattern, but you can learn a bit about it from the website. Uh, and then on Twitter, we are M.A. underscore Carrick because somebody had gotten to the version without the underscore before us. Curses. Yeah. And same thing with me. Uh, my website is swantower.com, but on Twitter it is swan underscore tower because somebody got that username before I got there. 
I am Alyss Helms everywhere. Uh, very unique name, so it was easy to get things. Um, but yeah, so AlyssHelms.com, Alyss Helms on Twitter. I'm also on, I, I'm on Facebook and I also, we have an M.A. Carrick Facebook account. Um, it's not terribly active. <laughs> and Facebook is the devil, so. Yes, it is. It, yeah. yeah. I, I yeah. am not on Facebook, which is why I forget to mention that one. That's Alyssa's job. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. that's that's good for your own personal mental health. So I applaud that because uh, it's it's a rough place to be. Uh, well, like I said at the top, uh, the mask mirrors. I'm going to hold it up here again in the, the 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 screen. It's got this beautiful cover. I mean, the the team at Orbit kill it with uh with the designs and and everything and Lauren and the team over there are always just absolutely phenomenal. Uh, so this is, this is one of those books. It's going to, it's going to look great on the shelf if, when you can go places where it will be on the shelf. You know, it's a big doorstopper of a novel. Um, so if, you know, if you're a fan of the, of the book that like can weigh down a ship and also be full of good story, this is your thing. Uh, I believe the book comes out on January 19th. This episode will drop after that. So it will be available now. So if you are watching or listening to this, go get you some, uh, cause it's out there in the world. And, uh, wow. And I'm not sure it'd be like M.A. Carrick, thank you for joining me on Fictitious or if I should be, you know, it's Marie and Alice, but, um, one way or another, this has been a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining me on the show. Thank you. Thank you for having us. 